Welcome to the Shudder. You know, there are a lot of things in this world that defy explanation by conventional means. Synchronicities that gleam divine intervention. In this installment, I've got some stories of clairvoyance, seeing the future or unintentionally predicting events. I found them to be quite interesting and from the right perspective, can make you shudder. Uh, three of these are fewer submissions and I found another in an online forum. Uh, you'll hear some ideologies and beliefs brought out in some of these, so just please be respectful with your comments. I do appreciate that. Okay, corner up in that love seat and settle in. I had left several friends in the U.S. to travel to Germany to visit my husband's family. I was pregnant at the time. On my very first night in Germany, I had a very strong dream about my friend Vic. The dream was very colorful. In the dream, he was in a hot air balloon going backwards, like in The Wizard of Oz, and yelling to me, goodbye Susie, goodbye, and waving. The dream, even though it had nothing disturbing in it, vaguely disturbed me enough to tell my husband about it the next morning. It left me with a strange feeling, like an impression was made on me. When I returned to the States six weeks later, I found out my friend, Vic, had died at the same time I had the dream. My friends did not want to call me and tell me because they were afraid it would ruin my vacation. But Vic came to tell me instead. I should mention that Vic was an old boyfriend, and while we were dating, we used to have very psychic things happen together. When I was two years old, my nine-year-old brother Bobby died of a stroke due to complications from a congenital heart defect. Several years later, when I was five, my mother put me to bed one evening at the usual time. Some time had lapsed, and a vision of a lady with a blue and white veil appeared on the ceiling above me. She told me that she was Jesus' mother Mary, and she brought my brother back from heaven to talk to me. Immediately, he appeared in the ceiling and floated down to where I lay. He took my hand and told me that he had come to show me what heaven was like so that I could tell my mom and she would be comforted. I felt myself being pulled through the dark room to the ceiling and into a bright mist. I saw many people in this place, including grandparents who died before I was born. He showed me things that are mentioned in the Bible about heaven such as a great palace with jewels inlaid into the walls, the streets of transparent gold, and the beings of light. I believe they were archangels surrounding God. Just as the Bible says, we were made into his image. He appeared as a person, but not quite the same. The features of his face were softened by the blazing light that surrounded him. When God spoke to me, he told me that I would go home soon, and to remember to tell my mother about what I had seen. Then, I was instantly back in my bed. When I awoke the next morning, I remember eating breakfast at the dining room table and telling my mother about my vision. She was telling me who the people I had seen were and that the things I was describing were spoken about in the Bible. It was such a vivid and amazing vision that even at 25 years old, I remember details very well. In relation to this story, Several years ago now, my mother was visiting the grave of my brother to place flowers on it. As she knelt beside the headstone, she asked for a sign that Bobby could hear what she was saying to him. After a few moments, she climbed into her minivan and returned home. She had the radio turned to the oldie station, and suddenly, my brother's favorite song, American Pie, began playing. She knew in her heart it was Bobby letting her know he heard her. Over a period of about a month, I would awaken from a deep sleep, sit up in bed, feeling afraid that there was a warning of some kind of something about to happen. The first time this happened, I tried to wake up my wife, thinking there was a fire in the house, because I could see the hallway off the bedroom and into the kitchen was full of smoke. I did not see flames or smell smoke, but smoke was everywhere. I would run out to the kitchen looking for fire, but could find none. 
Within a few minutes, the smoke would dissipate. My wife, as this occurred on several occasions, would get up with me and tell me there was nothing there, but I could still see the smoke disappearing around me while we were talking. After three or four occasions, I began to doubt that I was sane. Each time it happened, I would run out to the kitchen knowing I was definitely fully awake. I would sit at the table watching the smoke around me which would last for a few minutes. During this time, our kids started to complain of headaches and not feeling well. My wife complained of an odd odor in our bedroom closet but couldn't find anything. My wife wondered if it was the smell of gas. So as a precaution, the gas company came out and checked the situation and found that all was well. I was still plagued by the visions night after night. In all, the gas company checked the house twice this month. One Saturday morning, my wife had an unexpected visit from the superintendent of the gas company. He happened to be in the area visiting his family and because of the calls to our home, decided to see for himself what kind of problem we had. My wife was in the basement rec room with the children, so he was asked to come into that area. He wasn't even there two minutes when he asked my wife to take our children and get out of the house as quickly as possible. Unbeknownst to us, the rec room ceiling was bowed in a not so well lit corner and was full of raw crude oil. The house could have caught fire at any moment. The yard adjacent to the rec room was fully saturated progressing all the way to the rear yard. There was a major leak in a bypass oil line which saturated the ground to the point that it seeped through into the house, creating a pocket in the rec room ceiling and seeped upwards into the bedroom closet. Those lines were not being used anymore since the residence had been built, but were apparently abandoned with oil still in them. After removing the lines, there were no more nightmares of smoke and fire. The inspector who came unexpectedly could not explain what made him come that day or what made him concerned about the previous visits by his staff. Whatever happened, he saved our lives, and I believe the visions were a warning of potential disaster. I cannot explain why I had these visions, nor can I forget them even now. What mechanism was in place that gave me those visions and brought a perfect stranger from another city into our home that day. Decades back, I had a series of dreams that would transcend normalcy. If I'm honest with myself, it was the beginning of an acceptance of sorts. Coincidence had turned to something, for me, undeniable. I would either acknowledge it or keep quiet. Being a reasonable man, I did both. My friends would notice flashes, so to speak. I had a woman actually slap my face one day at work when I grabbed her hand at her request and jokingly told her fortune. She said that I was into voodoo crap. I had frightened her. I told my stepdaughter how many kids she'd have and that she'd marry twice. This has come to pass. Those paying attention narrow their eyes. Those that don't remain unaware. Family? Well, I was creepy. That seemed about right. Then the dreams began, and still do. Have you ever had a dream with no details? A vague awareness that you're asleep, yet the sensation seems meaningful and meaningless. It's disconcerting. Some call it sleep paralysis. In fact, it's not rare at all. Generally speaking, it affects between 15 and 25% of people sometime in their life. I guess, for simplification, it could be called half awake. This particular night was not one of those nights. My wife and I were sound asleep. My wife recalls being stirred awake by the sound of my voice. She told me later that I had been having a nightmare, or at least she assumed. I was mumbling, as most are prone to do at one time or another until I began repeating a phrase. This is what eventually fully woke her up. According to her, I was in a state. I was sweating, mumbling, and eventually began talking in my sleep. I had rendered her wide-eyed as she heard me stumble to clarity. I began repeating over and over, three men dead. She told me, as she watched, the words were muffled 
eventually gained enunciation until I was literally shrieking, three men dead, three men dead, repeatedly. She promptly woke me up. Mike, Mike, wake up. You're having a nightmare. I eventually roused, looked at her the way sleep allows, and asked her what was wrong. You were having one heck of a nightmare. You kept repeating, three men dead. Apparently, I muttered something, turned over, and went back to sleep. The next morning was uneventful. We got on with our routine when Bet casually asked if I remembered what I was dreaming about the night before. I stopped, thought, but could recall nothing. What happened, I asked. She told me the previous night's events, how I was screaming three men dead repeatedly. I had scared her, so she woke me up. I had apparently looked at her in the haze of sleep, then just turned over and rejoined the darkness. We both went to work, memories of dreams and murmurings forgotten. The day passed. We both came home, made supper, and settled down to watch the news. Live at 5, and then Steve Murphy at 6, the local newscast or journalist in our area. I suspect it's many Maritimers' daily routine. As Live at 5 began to transition into the 6 o'clock news, Bruce Frisco handed the reins to Steve, who immediately broke for commercial. Per usual, Mr. Murphy broke for his commercial with his typical tease, ensuring the audience would stay tuned. He exclaimed with great authority, We'll be back after this commercial break. Stay with us. We have a breaking local story. Three men dead. My wife looked at me puzzled. I was instantly mentally transported back to the night before, what I had said in my sleep stupor. We both waited in absolute silence. Steve came back on with a flourish and explained three men had died in Enfield while working on a huge septic tank. Eventually, all three had fallen in, each trying to save the other. All had succumbed. What an incredibly wrong way to go. My wife and I were in disbelief. Sadness washed over us. Somehow it felt almost personal. Decades later, we still tell the story to ourselves, and now you. The next time you discount something out of hand, may I suggest Shakespeare's oft-quoted, There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. This story is 100% true on my word and the word of my wife, Mike. Wow, really strange stuff. I want to thank Mike, a.k.a. Noche to Ipsum, for that last one. He is a fantastic writer. All the others wish to remain anonymous, and I thank them all the same. I uh, hope you enjoyed those accounts of precognition. There's another channel I'd like to turn you on to that does narrations. It's called Cryptids Canada. Uh, I don't know the lady's name, but I found her. She has a good cadence for telling stories. Uh, I'll put the link in the description below. Okay, if you enjoyed those, please consider hitting that like button and sharing. And if you subscribe, make sure you hit that notification bell so you can join me here next time for The Shutter. <laughs>